Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 25 and we're going to be just contrasting Punnett squares which we have looked at previously with something new called pedigrees. So what we need to do here is we need to construct and interpret information and data from pedigrees and Punnett squares. The main thing we want to try and do is to distinguish when we use each of these very important tools to analyze genetic problems. So I've included Punnett squares in here, but I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on Punnett squares because we've already been talking through them. We've been using them both in class and also um, in these videos and in the PowerPoints so that you've had a little bit of experience with Punnett squares, but we haven't looked at pedigrees. So what I'll do is just give you a little bit of an overview of Punnett squares just so we can contrast when we use those with our use of Punnett squares. The main thing that obviously I want you to be able to do is to see if you can solve a range of genetic problems using both Punnett squares and pedigrees. So how do we know what are these things and, and how do we know when to use them? Well, we have already used Punnett squares as I've talked uh, about a few times already. And the main reason we would use these is for making predictions. So I guess the main thing you want to look at for Punnett squares is they um, uh, look at the future. Okay, they look forward. Um, forward. Probably important here. that We look forward with uh, Punnett squares. We, we look at our parents. We look at the particular trait that we're after. We look at how these parents would combine what sort of gametes they might produce and therefore what are the likelihoods of various combinations being produced as a result. And our Punnett squares are fantastic for helping us to do that, to solve genetic problems based on breeding experiments um, such as the one that, that Mendel was involved in. But there are a number of reasons why we might not be able to do that. Uh, obviously, doing breeding experiments with humans isn't a particularly good idea. There are ethical considerations and moral considerations, but there's also um, other considerations such as time. Certain organisms reproduce very quickly through their cycles, others much slower. If you're looking at um, inheritance patterns in something like bacteria that, that reproduce every 20 minutes or so, you're going to get a lot of generations and a lot of data very quickly. If you look at humans, you have to wait until they're at least of reproductive age, and that's not necessarily uh, correct morally, um, but it's still a long, long time, certainly to look at any sort of uh, longevity in terms of um, effects of genetic inheritance. So one alternate way of, of doing these crosses and looking forward is to look um, at historical data, so to look backwards. Uh, into the past. And that is really what we use pedigrees for. You may actually have um, encountered one of these if you've been um, in the market for a, a, a pet, particularly a pet where you want to know the background. It might be a show pet, a show dog or, or a cat, and you want to know um, what what the parents were, what the lineage, what the ancestry is. You may even have used ancestry programs which uh, are available online that actually tell us about our own ancestry and some of the um, some of the, the different people and maybe even the different nationalities that are part of our own history. And this is where pedigrees are most useful. The one difference, I guess, between a pedigree that I might use to look at my own ancestry and the sorts of pedigrees that we're going to be using in this course is that our pedigrees are going to focus on a single characteristic, a single trait. We're interested not in who everyone was, but just in the pattern of inheritance of a particular trait through a family line. So let's look at some examples. The first thing we want to do is just refresh our memory about Punnett squares. And obviously Punnett squares are important. I, if, I guess the name is unusual enough for you to have already concluded that it was named after somebody. Uh, Reginald Punnett was the um, scientist or at, at least the uh, gentleman who came up with this particular strategy. And he, he came up with it specifically to look at how you track alleles through the gametes of particular individuals and then use those combinations of gametes to produce a cross. And here's one, here's an example, hopefully, because uh, I didn't put this into my last video on uh, multiple alleles, but hopefully you recognize this is an example of multiple alleles. And uh, in this case, both parents have the A and the B 
So therefore, both parents would be um, having the blood type AB. This is relatively rare, certainly rare for two parents to have uh, both AB blood types. But you can see when we do the cross, when we bring the A's down and the A and the B together, you can see that only half of the offspring of these parents would be expected to have the same blood type, the same AB blood type. Half of the children would have a different blood type. A quarter of them would have blood type B and a quarter of them would have blood type A. This is why we do Punnett squares. It's nice and easy for us to do these crosses. As long as we can identify the gametes that are coming from the, uh, each parent and then um, look at the probabilities of how these might combine together. This, on the other hand, is a pedigree. Now, you can see with a pedigree that there's a lot more information that we need to be aware of. For example, we tend to call um, the squares males and the circles females. I'm not going to get into who's a square and why the females are curved, but that's the convention and that's what we use. So you can see that at the top of this pedigree is a couple, uh, a male and a female. The line that joins them is a marriage line, so it means these two were married. The line below that comes off and the ones that you can see that are joined to this line are the offspring of that particular marriage, so the children of that marriage. And when we look at them, we are looking at them uh, in order, so in their birth order. So they would have had a daughter and then a son and then another daughter and another son. Now you can see that three of their four children have actually married. So here is a marriage, another marriage here. And here are two children from this marriage. So they would be grandchildren of our originals. So from these pedigrees, you can see some familial relationships, first of all. Parents, mothers, sons, daughters, uncles, aunts, cousins, uh, great-grandparents, grandparents, grandparents uh, grandchildren, and so on. So, so I guess the first thing that we need to, to think about generally with pedigrees is that we do have ways of being able to identify family relationships. And that's why we said we, we used pedigrees in the first place, to look at these family trees. But we also have something else that's part of our pedigrees. And the other thing that's part of our pedigrees is we're tracking particular types of traits through. Now, usually you will find these traits uh, labeled, uh, often you can use sort of a black and a white. Um, so uh, if you have one that's kind of colored in, that might show a particular trait, and where it's not coloured in, that might show the normal condition. Um, it could also be the dominant condition, so let's call it P for pedigree. So this might be a capital P, these might be little p's. Um, of course, one of the things with pedigrees too is that because we're not doing the breeding experiments, if we know that um, the male, for example, that I've just drawn is uh, expressing a dominant trait, we don't know whether he's homozygous or heterozygous. So he could be big P, big P, or he could be big P, little P. We know if we have um, the recessive condition that it must be two little P's because there's no other option. Now, that's assuming, again, autosomal dominance, and we don't have uh, variations like co-dominance and incomplete dominance and um, sex linkage and multiple alos. But all of those can be shown through pedigrees as well, just not all at once. So we work through um, this particular pedigree has something that's uh, a little unusual in that it shows these kind of half, half conditions. So that already tells you that these are heterozygous. So if you've got a, a pedigree that gives you a bit of a clue, um, these are heterozygous. So if we were using P's, for example, this would be a big P and a little P. And you can see that both our original parents are big P, little P which they would need to be because they have children that are homozygous for both conditions. So that means they've had to have a combination that gives two big P's and a combination that gives two little P's. This is the trick of pedigrees. The trick of pedigrees is to work through the steps, uh, work through each of the family lines, see if you can find out where the trait is um, and whether the trait is dominant or recessive, and then once you've done that, then you're looking at 
whether or not you can determine the genotypes of all of the individuals involved. And be aware of the fact that we can't always determine all the genotypes for the reason that I mentioned before. Sometimes we may know that an individual is expressing the dominant condition, but we may not have enough information to know whether or not they are uh, uh, pure breeding, homozygous, or the hybrid heterozygous condition. A couple of important tips for pedigrees then. Firstly, if an individual is homozygous and that homozygous condition is recessive, then both parents must have at least one recessive allele. So one recessive allele, so one little p, uh, has to come from each of the parents. Now that could mean that one of the parents is also homozygous recessive, but it could mean that they're both uh, heterozygous dominant. But they've got to have the little p's in there that um, can come out for that individual to be homozygous recessive. If an individual shows the dominant trait, at least one parent must have the dominant phenotype. So if we've got a big P, um, then if the individual is showing that, they can do that either with two big P's or with a big P, little P. And so they must have got at least one of these from one parent. So again, we can go back and look at it. One of the parents must be showing the dominant condition. Possible that both are, but at least one must. And if both parents are homozygous recessive, then all the offspring will be homozygous recessive. So if all you've got in the parents is little peas, then obviously the only gametes that each of those can produce are little peas, and therefore everything is also only going to be little peas. So what are you going to look for first when you start to analyse your pedigrees? Well, this is what I would do. I would look for parents where the two parents are the same phenotype, but they have a child with a different phenotype. So what you can see is Anne and Michael are both white and Carla is shaded. So Carla is the child of Anna and Michael and, and because she is shaded, she is expressing a different phenotype from her parents. Now this actually automatically tells me that this is the recessive condition. Okay, so let me make them bees just to make it easy. Now, I know they must be little bees. Why? Because if Anna and Michael were both little bees, so they're the same, little bee, little bee, little bee, little bee, the only option that they could produce from, from number three of our chart is little bees. So they'd have to have the same, which means that Carla must be the recessive condition and Anne must be a big B, little b, because she's got a little b to have given to Carla, but she must have a big B to have the different condition. And Michael, for exactly the same logical reason, must be likewise. Once you've done that, you can start to go through your pedigree. Obviously, Wilma and Tom and Arlene are the easiest ones because they're showing the same uh, phenotype as Carla. Remember, in pedigrees, we're tracking a particular trait. So we're just looking at a particular trait. So that means this trait um, is present in Arlene, Wilma, Tom, or Carla, or perhaps, depending on the trait, is absent from Arlene, Wilma, Tom, or Carla. But they are also all expressing the same phenotype. And so therefore, if we've worked out that that's the recessive condition, then we can go through and label all of these. Now, what it also means is that every one of the dominant ones has got at least one big B. So you can go through and label all these big B, big B, big B, big B, all the way around. Now, what we don't know necessarily is whether or not all of these uh, dominant uh, expressed individuals is homozygous or heterozygous. So we're looking for clues. So the first clue is Arlene. So Arlene can only do little Bs. So that means her children, Sam, must have a little b, and we know that Anne already does have the little b. Now, the other interesting thing about Arlene is that the children she had with George, two of those children were actually uh, recessive, expressed the recessive trait, which means they must have not just got the little b from Arlene, they must have also got it from George. So we now know what George is. When we come to um, our... Tom and Sandra, uh, I'm going to leave Sandra over here for the moment because the two children from Sandra and Tom are both uh, big Bs. 
uh, and that is that they are uh, expressing the dominant condition. But they must also be a little b as well, because that's all Tom could have um, had present in his gametes. So that means both Daniel and Alan, as children of Sandra and Tom, are big b, little b. They got a big b from their mother, Sandra, but they got the little b from their father, Tom. You might be starting to be aware of the fact now that Tina and Christopher and also Sandra, we cannot determine whether or not they are homozygous or heterozygous. We don't have enough information in our table to determine whether or not those are big B, big Bs or big B, little Bs. So you would comment on that if you were not able to show it. So this is how we take information from a trait that's expressed in a pedigree, see if we can work out the individual genotypes of each of the individuals that are present in the pedigree. A little bit of practice is what's going to help with pedigrees. Good luck and thanks for watching.